Tickets. Tickets, please. Step inside, take a ride, upon the terror train. All aboard, be fair warned, these rails house fear and pain. Find a seat, don't mind the heat, just pray the lights stay on. Upon these rails, these bloody rails, in darkness lies no dawn. Yes, step inside, come crawl or glide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Take it, please. <laughs> James Ward Kirk Publications presents Terror Train. Episode 105, Wisconsin and Illinois. Take it, please. The Willen by Justin Hunter. Ryan gripped the cold corrugated metal of the rusted boxcar door. The train was already beginning to move. His hands, black with grime, his knuckles standing out, white against the skin of his emaciated flesh. 
fought against losing his grip. The metal of the poorly mended door flexed outward, threatening to drop him to the ground and back into the cold night. He had spent the last three nights sleeping out in the open, waiting for the next train to arrive. His muscles felt stiff and frozen. The promise of an old boxcar to sleep in, walls to protect him from the wind, and a roof to save him from the rain, seemed as much of a godsend as a night in a five-star resort. The train picked up speed. His left hand slipped on the metal, slicing a deep furrow across his palm. He groaned and heaved with all the strength he had left. He threw his right leg into the boxcar and pulled himself inside. The piecemeal door shut behind him with a loud clang. Ryan lay on his back and breathed heavily. He felt a thin layer of dust beneath his head. A slight wisp of breeze, biting cold, crossed over his frame from a crack in the door. He had no strength left to pull deeper into the boxcar and away from the frigid air. He fell asleep where he lay. The train rumbled on. He woke to the waning sunset. The sky was the pink of the horizon, blending into a deep purple before allowing the blackness of night to overtake all. He rolled over onto his side, his body protesting every moment of movement. From what he could tell, he had stayed in the same position the whole time he slept. He swept away a stick that had left a deep imprint in his back from his uncomfortable sleep, as if he planned to sleep in the same place again and didn't want to suffer it all over again. Ryan rubbed his face with his hands. He lost himself in reverie, but started when he caught a flash of movement from the far corner of the boxcar. He's awake now, is he? The voice was gravelly and rough. Slept a long time there, son. Must have had it pretty rough out there. The man stood and moved into the last ray of dying light. He was old, yet age was a hard thing to tell from a life on the rails. Hard living ages a person fast. He wore dirty clothes, layered so thickly that Ryan couldn't make a good guess at the man's build. He didn't like the way the man was looking at him, sizing him up. Ryan watched the man's eyes travel several times up and down his body, making him feel small and weak. Young, the man said. How old are you, son? Twenty, Ryan said, shifting his body up to a sitting position. Nah, the man laughed. You can't be more than fifteen. You've got those scrawny arms and legs. No man muscles on you. What do you want? The man laughed again. The sound was harsh, as if the man's lungs were caked with wet mucus, broken only by barking mirth. It was painful for Ryan to hear. Nothing. I don't want anything you're unwilling to give. I just thought we could pass the time here for a while. I know these rails, and, and I know there isn't going to be a stop for a long run. They've got two drivers up there taking turns sleeping and running the train. It's going to be just you and me for a long stretch. Ryan tried to hold the man's stare, but felt so uncomfortable he looked at the floor. You may be young, but I bet you know a thing or two. I bet you've been broken in real good. You know how this works on the rails? I know how it works, Ryan said. I'll fight you if you try anything. You'll fight me? The man's voice arose a creaky octave with the question. This is my car, boy. You want to ride in here, you have to pay the toll. I'll see that you're broken and proper. Roll over and pay. I won't let you. Suit yourself, the man said, shrugging. Get out. He pulled back the boxcar door. A cold blast of wind, flecked with snow, chilled Ryan through his meager clothing. The man smiled broadly, his brown and broken teeth pressed taut in his grinning maw. Ryan felt the cold bite to the bone. He hadn't eaten in days. He knew he had no strength to fight. 
His body shivered as he took one last look at his filthy and roached attacker. Then he rolled over on his stomach and lay still. Go ahead, Ryan said. His voice came out so soft that it was almost inaudible. The man laughed, his foul, wet bark again. Ryan heard him unbuckle his belt. Then hard hands jerked his pants down to his ankles. His boxer briefs came down next. The man tore them in his haste to pull them down. Ryan felt his mind lapse into memories, as it did whenever this happened to him. It was far from the first time. He thought of his room in his mother's house. He thought of sinking into the soft mattress of his bed. He remembered the smell of his pillow. He felt himself sink into the warmth and coziness of the safety and love. Then the memories turned on him. They always did. He remembered his mother's boyfriend, the one with the large, sagging paunch and the thick, hairy arms, the one who would wander into his room after his mother fell asleep, the one who took away his safety, the one that made him run away in the first place. The hatred he felt for the man startled him back to reality. The ragged vagrant had finished. He was breathing heavily, his chest rattling wetly with each intake of air. Sweat iced his brow. He sat down near the door of the boxcar and lit the remaining half inch of a cigarette. He held it out to Ryan, offering him a drag. Ryan shook his head. He rolled onto his back and pulled his pants back on, throwing the torn remains of his boxers into a corner of the car. His own breathing was calm. He, in fact, felt calm. There was a night at home when he had prepared himself for his mother's boyfriend. During dinner, the man had patted him on the bottom with his ape-like hand when his mother wasn't looking. He whispered in his ear that tonight he was going to tear into his mother, then tear into him. After washing the dishes, Ryan stole a long kitchen knife and hid it beneath his pillow. He pretended to sleep as he heard his mother and her boyfriend having sex in the next room. He waited several hours into the night until he heard the sound of bed springs creaking through the wall, telling him that his mother's boyfriend had risen and was coming for him. He listened to the soft thudding of feet as his attacker made his way to his bedroom. He heard his breathing quicken with excitement through his cheap pressed wood door. The door opened and the large mass of the man filled the doorway. He was fully nude. Ryan felt his skin crawl as the man touched his ankle beneath the sheets. The man was strong. Ryan felt himself pulled from under the covers and flopped onto his mattress. The man moved forward to mount him. Ryan, the steel flashing in the reflected moonlight, slashed out with the knife, cutting his mother's boyfriend across his ample stomach. The man bellowed. Ryan tried to cut him again, but the man grasped his wrist, almost breaking his bones with his grip. The man punched him hard in the face. Ryan's vision blackened at the edges. He could hear his mother screaming in the background. His spirit soared as he thought she was here to save him. He thought she would get rid of the man who was hurting him. But when his pain began to clear, he realized that she was screaming at him. She was daubing her boyfriend's wound with a towel, begging him for forgiveness, while she turned her head toward Ryan and hurled rebukes at him. He held the blood-dripping knife in his hand and looked into his mother's eyes. He didn't recognize her anymore. And worse, she didn't seem to recognize him. He left that night. A new day had dawned in the boxcar. Ryan sat in the doorway, his legs dangling over the side, and watched a thick forest of birch trees fly by him. He held the kitchen knife in his hand. The blade showed nicks, bent slightly at the handle and definitely not as sharp. But it would do. It would do the job just fine. The man slept behind him. 
Soon he would wake up, and Ryan would go to work. He would work on the man, like he had so many others. His mother wasn't here to stop him. Not this time. Not ever again. He listened to the gentle clacking of the wheels on the rails. It lulled him. Soon the man would wake up. But there was time for this. There was time to watch the gentle snowfall. Time to gaze upon the trees. The limbs sagging with the weight of billowing snow. Midnight Train by Mary Genevieve Fortier Lonely, empty, evil earth Crept its way, the rail its birth Upon this endless midnight train A moonless night in shadowed rain That fell upon the window pane Staring back, the darkness black. Wisps of smoke, clouds of white, Cold and dark upon the night, Cold and broken, chilled and dead, Whispers spoken, filled with dread. My mind a chamber, clothed in black, A spectre felt unseen. Within the silence, behind my back, I swear, I heard a scream. A head upon this spectral rail begins my terrifying tale. From Illinois, I on this train, some odd decoy, misled, disdain. Who but I, a passenger, now gone awry, some messenger of death, though I still have a breath. Within each car, they sit and stare, some burned and charred, some simply there. A man in chains appears to host, his visage wanes, he is a ghost, with eyes of deep and bleeding red, approaches me, removes his head, and bows as if I were his guest, within my throat a scream suppressed. I closed my eyes, oh please move on. In a moment, he was gone. Beyond their calls, a chasm, 
where some thing crawls phantasm, clawing bloody soaked, gnawing cartilage choked, then tilt its head to scream with some undead extreme, contrived, comprising evil, devised, despising devil. Within the path it swayed, as I then looked away, a sorcery at hand, I dared my legs to stand. In shadows shuffled, past murmurs muffled, of disembodied cries, again I closed my eyes. I pled a desperate acclamation, this unfortunate abomination, held captive on this hellish ride, aversive this unsanctified, revulsive space, then turned to face the conductor who held his tongue within his hand which he slung as a bell he wished to ring toward the window motioning. The next stop, Alton, the signpost read. Oh yes, Alton, they know the dead. No stop was made upon this track, no stop was made, no turning back, yet through the doors and seeped the walls. The specters came, they creeped, they crawled, one by one they came inside, some slithering, some seemed to glide, one by one they climbed aboard, some in silence, others roared. A knife protruding from the back Of a man all dressed in black His severed limbs he dragged behind Then gazed at me, intent maligned Where in Hades had we gone? An eyeless child who sang a song A lullaby, bizarre and wrong Escaped its throat, slit and bleeding Not from its mouth, sown receding Within its sunken head which lay upon the bed. Suddenly the car lost light, trapped in fear, without sight. I grappled through this engine, blind. Somewhere safe to sit, I'd find. A chug, a thug, a whistle blew. But in the dark, the deepest dark, my final breath I drew. Upon this dark, unearthly train, riding the rails, misled, disdain, a stranger once without a name, among the dead I ride insane, among the dead we tread ahead upon this midnight train.
who rides the rails eternally upon the terror train. Survived this trek? No turning back. Dare resist, just try. Step back inside, we'll be your guide. So many ways to die. Upon this ride, nowhere to hide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Terror Train Podcast, Episode 105, Wisconsin and Illinois. Produced by Krista Clark Grabowski, David Schutz II, and Mary Genevieve Fortier. Podcast directed and arranged by David Schutz II. The Conductor, Your Narrator, was created by and played by David Schutz II. Terror, The Disembodied Voice, was created by and played by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Terror Train podcast opening and closing poems written by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Host segment dialogue for Terror, the Disembodied Voice, written by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Production music, The House of Leaves, Chase Pulse, The Hive, and The Voices by Kevin MacLeod in Competech.com. Featured works, The Willing, written by Justin Hunter. Production music, Ice Demon. One of Them, Classic Horror One, and Controlled Chaos, No Percussion, by Kevin MacLeod in Capitec.com. Midnight Train, written by Mary Genevieve Fortier, winner of the Editor's Choice Award for Terror Train, from James Wardkirk Publishing. Production Music, Bump in the Night, Red Letter, Apprehension, and Decay, by Kevin MacLeod in Capitec.com. Additional sound effects by audiosoundclips.com Podcast program edited by David Schutz II The stories and poems presented in the Terror Train podcasts are all featured in the James Ward Kirk Publishing Anthology, Terror Train, which was edited by Krista Clark Grabowski and A. Henry Keene. Cover art by Stephen Cooney. Content copyright 2014. Terror Train Podcast episode 105, Wisconsin and Illinois. Copyright 2014.